Thank you, Paul, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for attending the very ultimate presentation of uh, first day. Uh, my presentation, it was shifted from the case studies uh, section uh, to this position here, so it's a case study. And I'm talking about the optimization of the AF combustion and CO emission reduction through a smart consigner modification. The case study um, that I'm talking about today was carried out in the past two years uh, together with Dukerhof in the Lingerich plant, which is in the northwestern part of Germany, not far away from here. The plant is operating two kilns, a smaller one with a capacity of 1,500 tons per day and a bigger one with a capacity of 3,700 tons per day. The kiln under investigation, our case study, was kiln four, so the smaller one. It has a kiln uh, of 3.2 uh, meters in diameter and an L to D ratio of 15. It is equipped with a one string and five stage preheater and a um, calciner, a short calciner, was attached later on to that system. The last modification was in uh, 1980. The kiln is fired by a mix of lignite, RDF and solvents, whereby the solvents are fed through the main burner only. Although the um, cement making process is well known, well established and looks from the outside always the same, each and any plant is unique to some extent and each and any plant has a unique history and a unique operational background. The situation that we were facing when we came together with Glückerhoff here was the following. The calciner itself, it's shaped like you see on the two pictures here. In the middle, it has an inclined section, which is quite common for calciners that were retrofitted. It helps to shift out the geometry out of the existing structure, and it's almost unavoidable. This section is on top round, but it has a flat bottom, which helps the material to slide down if it segregates from the gas flow. On top, it has a typical Polysius double deflector, which is useful in terms of mixing, which helps finally to uh, increase the degree of calcination and to reduce emissions like of CO, for instance. It has two mirror boxes, here and here, whereby only the upper one is in operation. It's quite surprising why it's the upper one. The tertiary air is fed in a rather unconventional way from the side, just above the orifice. There's also a top air duct to introduce a staged combustion, but this is not an operation nowadays. The bypass gas is extracted from the kiln in the chamber on one side. Uh, originally, and I said it was in 1980, this calciner was designed for a pure lignite firing. And I also already said the calciner is rather short and has a theoretical retention time of two to three seconds. When it was fired with pure lignite, that was not an issue because the, the powerous and very fine coal was easy to burn, and it was no problem, especially if you consider um, the mixing chamber at the top to bound this material. But with time and in recent years, as all the other plants, this plant was also forced to introduce alternative fuels and to replace most of the coals uh, mostly in form um, of RDF. When they started to introduce the typical calciner RDF, what you know, this 2D material, then they were facing that they have exceptionally high and non-acceptable uh, acceptable CO emissions. In many, many field trials and in a very hard work, they found out that if they inject <coughs> pelletized material, the CO emissions go down. In addition, they experienced, because the, the process became a bit more unstable with the pelletized material, they discovered if they start to, we call it a pre-grinding, it's hard to describe, they do not disintegrate it down to powder, they just apply a force and make it a bit smaller than it was originally. But they found an optimal point for this, sorry? They found an optimal point um, of this pre-grinding where the process ran almost 
acceptable. Still, the CO emissions were moderate, high, uh, in a level of 800 to 1,000 milligrams of normal cubic meter. To achieve this, they had to shift their burners, and this is the very uniqueness of this um, calciner. And they're now penetrating in a vertical way through the kiln inlet shelf. And they are shooting with a speed of 40 meters per second the fuel into the calciner. Quite surprising for us when we were facing this situation. So under grinding the material, selecting pelletized material, and shifting the burners, they then were able to increase their uh, substitution rate. But still, they were not able to run the calciner completely coal free. There was still a, a remaining coal portion that they had to introduce. And the task when we came together was, how can we make the calciner ready for 100% TSR with respect to the calciner? I'm talking just about the calciner. And we have to keep an eye on the, on the CO emissions finally. And at that point, Dukohoff involved Exergy. For those who don't know us, um, our business concept is uh, a process engineering company to develop together with our clients solutions to match these tasks without building, for instance, a new calciner. We try to develop solutions that are much smarter than just building a new calciner. But all these findings or these solutions are based on a very deep understanding of the process and require a quite high knowledge of what we are doing. All of us, we were quite puzzled why this process produces less CO with pellets compared to um, the fluffy RDF. Because our, our common understanding of combustion is the smaller the particle is, the quicker it burns. And the smaller the particle is, or the more 2D shaped the particle is, the easier should it be to transport through a calciner. But here the situation was completely different. Due to that reason, we decided to set up some laboratory tests. And the first one was related to the pneumatic conveying of the pre-ground um, pellets. For that reason, we used a zigzag sifter, <coughs> and the device is quite similar to that one I'm showing here. The zigzag sifter is flown through from the bottom up with gas, and we are feeding the material, a sample of it, into this zigzag sifter. And then, dependent on the gas speed in here, the material is either dropping into this collection box, or it is uh, carried over into the cyclone. So we started with an experiment that had a speed of 16 meters per second, and we had a residue that was the material that even did not be, uh, was not able to be carried under 16 meters per second. And we had a carryover of material, which we again refed into their sifter, but with a lower speed. And by doing many trials and reducing the speed even down to 2.5 meters per second, we were able to classify the material and I gave a presentation two years ago in Barcelona and explained how it works. It was a complete uh, presentation on that. But we are now able to classify the material and have the information for this in inhomogeneous material. How much speed does it require to be transported pneumatically in a safe way? If we would do the same thing for, I call it a fluffy RDF, so the standard RDF you know from your plants, then the result is complete inverse. Why with the pelletized RDF, or pre, I must say pre-ground pelletized RDF, most of the material was stored in the classes with a high speed. For the fluffy fluff, the material is collected mostly in the low speed regions. And especially if we look at the fluffy fluff, then we see in these classes which requires the high speed, these are screws, balls, stones, so all of this is incombustible material, inert material. So if it is not carried by our calciner, we don't care. We have made this to a standard approach nowadays to, uh, nowadays to characterize alternative fuels. And we put that usually in a curve, which is the particle velocity distribution. It's quite similar to what you know as a particle size distribution. But now we have the minimum gas velocity instead of the diameter 
on the x curve, uh, on the x-axis. You see in yellow the RDF pellets, and you see in blue the fluffy RDF. And what we can see is that most of the fluffy RDF can be transported with a speed of less than 8 meters per second, while the pelletized or the pre-ground pelletized material requires mostly more than 10 meters per second. Not surprising, we have seen the pellets, they are much bigger than the 2D particles are, but it has proven our assumption, well, the pellets must be more difficult to carry. And still we believe the coarse particles burn slower, so there is still the question, why the hell is in this particular calcina less CO produced if we insert the pellets? To get an answer to this, we did what we quite often do. We applied a model. What you see here is the result. And we always get that question, so I have to answer that question again. This is not a Hollywood movie, so we don't show what we expect that happens. We show what is the result of a real physics calculation. So we put in the information of the fuel, of the geometry of the calcina, of the process data, and we calculate forwards, and that is the result. And if the result is not good, then it is indeed the result of what we see from the process. So the result here is quite close to what we have to expect from the process. And the result was quite interesting, because we see here, we shoot in the fuel particles. It's hard to see, but maybe you can see. We shoot in the fuel particles, and then they are carried in this inclined section, but along the inclined section, they are settling, somehow even here, and then they are sliding down, and they are resuspended, at least to most of them. Some of them are raining out into the kiln in the chamber, and we form it, we call it like a fluidized bed. So the particles are too heavy to be carried safely up, but this is an advantage in that case, because now they are circulating in that region so long that they can burn out. And the retention time of the particles is much higher than the theoretical two to three seconds that we expect from the gas flow calculation. In addition, we see that there is quite a lot of material raining out of the calcina down into the kiln in the chamber. And to keep this amount as low as possible, they needed to apply the pre-grinding. They made the particles smaller, and that reduced the amount of material that dropped down here. If we would use instead the fluffy, easy to, to suspend particles, then they would be carried straight through the calciner, and their retention time would be very close to the theoretical retention time of two to three seconds. If, if we look at the other two pictures that you see here, um, then we see their plots of the CO concentration. As usual, I say that first, red is a lot, Blue is almost nothing. And we see here, okay, the CO is produced in the combustion zone. And then we see a lot of CO is permanently produced from the material that is sliding down the bottom, the flat bottom of this inclined section. And we have some stratification. So the gas is going up here, and the CO is released here, and there's almost no chance to mix it with the available oxygen. And so we carry this strand and be careful, this is a different scale. We carry this strand into the double deflector and can reoxidize the produced CO only to some extent so that we finally are facing CO emissions of more than 1,000 milligrams per normal cubic meter. But still, this situation is better than with the, with the uh, flat particles, with the easy to suspend particle, because that would be carried quickly through and would even burn here and would produce more CO than under this situation. A second test we did in our lab is a furnace test. Finally, we have done that with up to 60 different particles out of an RDF mix. So we, we selected by hand some characteristic particles and tried that in a furnace. We have put these particles into a hot, constantly thrown through uh, gas furnace, the temperature was around 1000 degrees and we limited a bit the oxygen, it was around 15 to 17 percent, I, I don't remember the exact figure. 
I can show you only here the two particles. The first one is a part of a label sticker, fr sticker from uh, a soft drink bottle. The size was 25 times 25 millimeters, and the weight, we weighed it before, is 12 milligrams. And the second one is also not unusual particle. It's a screw anchor. The size is 30 times 5, and it's 3D times, again, 5 millimeters. And the weight is 140 milligrams. And now you see what happens. If I find my arrow, we put them in, and they start to burn. We see phases with a strong flame, then a phase with a weak flame, and finally some glooming that is the burnout of the char. And in order to be able to understand the kinetics of this combustion, we measured the times. And surprisingly, even for this very flat, rather low, uh, low size particle, the time that requires for burnout is between four and five seconds. So remember, retention time of the calciner is two to three seconds, so that is burning slower than it has time to do in the calciner. And the big particle here, it requires 35 to 40 seconds, so even much longer. But this particle cannot be carried quickly through the calciner, so it remains longer in the system, and so it has more time to burn. In order, if, if we have this understanding of the process, then we are enabled uh, to develop a smart retrofit concept. We know, okay, the CO emissions of this calcina can only reduce, be reduced if we increase the temperature. Okay, that's not really an option. If we improve the oxygen availability for the fuel, or if we enhance the retention time for the fuel. For the fluffy RDF, we know it's carried through straightly through the calciner. So the limit is the retention time. And the coarse and high-dense particles, they are producing CO due to a lack of oxygen. So that is a question of mixing. And the concept that you see here, I will explain it now. I must say it has been finally developed by the engineers of the Lengerich plant. It's very strange. And the solution, to the best of our knowledge, there is no reference in the world for such kind of a solution. They suggested to implement some kind of a pre-combustion chamber. It looks like a Christmas man uh, rucksack. And they wanted, the, the intention is we still feed the fuel in here and we make it circulating in a much more compact zone than all along this inclined section. To make it circulating, they suggested to connect the TA duct just from the front side and deflecting the particles to make them rotating in this compact pre-combustion chamber. The first question was, may we, may we overheat that section? But from our simulations, I haven't shown that, sorry, because of the time. We know that even the meal is sliding down the shelf here and it's cooling that section to some extent. But anyway, the solution looks quite strange, and even we were not convinced from upfront that it will work. So, of course, we go back again with the change geometry to our model. We use the same process data, the same fuel data, we just changed the geometry. And what we see here is it really happens what we expected. The material starts to swirl in the combustion chamber and the zone of combustion is much more compact. So less particles are going up here. This is still running with a pre-ground pellet and they are now rotating here until they are almost burned out and then carried out of the system. Again that is the same picture with the same scale of the CO and we see now we produce the CO still in the combustion zone but further up it's much lower and especially and that is why I have chosen this horrible greenish color in the as is situation to, to show you that there is really a difference and now we the model says we can bring down the CO emissions by a compa by 70% compared to today's operation that is really a word 
Since this simulation was quite successful, the plant asked us uh, to make another simulation by using now fluffy RDF. So they wanted to go back to the standard RDF that can be used in a calciner. The situation here, you see, it changes somehow due to the different flight behavior of the particles I explained before, but it's still working. Again, we observed a, compared to today's operation, a reduction of CO, but compared to the pelletized system, the CO increases a bit. But still, we can say the, the savings of CO um, is expected to be in the range of 60%. The advantage of that solution is, of course, that they can save quite a lot of fuel cost expenditures because they had to pre-treat by this pre-grinding pre approach, they can save this pre-treatment of the pellets and that saves quite a lot of money. Uh, actually, I don't know whether that works. We have outside in the booth, we give you the chance to fly with a virtual reality class through that calcina I showed you now. It's now quite quick and it's the, the, the density is not good of that video. But take the chance to come to our booth and to take a look into our calcina. Finally, with this, let's say, quite smart engineering work and with the modeling behind, the engineers of the, of the Langerich plant were able to convince their management to really build this rather strange solution. And as we are no suppliers for equipment, they realized the modification and the retrofit themselves. We just gave the drawings how to do it. And we see here again the curve for the monthly CO emission. <coughs> and the retrofit was here where this uh, pinkish um, pieces and we can see there was a, a huge effect that even we did not expect because we could even bring down after startup the CO emissions um, by 70 to 80 percent and this situation was achieved even under the introduction of a hundred percent fluffy RDF after the startup. If you do such kind of a retrofit, there's always something that you have to repair after you start up the system. We uh, had in the, in the uh, conceptual phase, we already said, well, there might be some overheating of the roof of that rucksack, but we decided to do nothing against um, in the first step. But finally, they observed really an overheating of the roof. The model said it is a 1450 degrees. In reality, it was 1370, something like that. So we even a bit over predicted the system. But finally, it was hotter than expected. Um, this was overcome by adding a meal, a cooling meal injection point. And finally, now the system is running since July 2018 till today. Besides the uh, increase of the uh, TSR, and besides the reduction of the CO emissions, they had also some economical benefits. So they could increase their total substitution rates by 22 percent points. They could reduce their fuel costs just through the substitution of lignite by RDF by 1.40 euros per ton of clinker. There was an additional reduction of fuel costs due to the elimination of these pre-ground pellets. Another one euro per ton of clinker. So in total, they saved 2.40 euro per ton of clinker. I recently heard, and that was just given to me in January, they could even increase their production capacity, which is quite important for the plant because they are running always at empty silos. So that is also a nice side benefit. But just due to this information and not taken into account um, the increase in the production capacity, the return on investment for this modification was less than six months. I just want to give you some take home messages. So we have shown that you can use a CFD study 
even to predict a minority component like CO. For those who are not familiar with this, with a CFD, that might be not surprising, but if you're trying to calculate something which is in the system in the range of PPM, that is always already a bit difficult. Um, it is good that if you apply a model to make a modification uh, or to, to prove the, the feasibility of a modification that has no reference in the world. And it really helps to convince uh, the decision makers to go for something like that. We have proven that this propo proposed unconventional rate of fit was successful. And we could show that some additional benefit could be generated by uh, the downgrading of the alternative fuel quality and that also uh, leading to some substantial fuel cost savings. And the next message is it's always good to do a careful engineering up front and to include the simulation to have a project success. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm open for questions. So thank you very much indeed, uh, Matthias, for a very interesting uh, presentation and uh, I think it was a good uh, result for everybody that was uh, concerned. Uh, can you give us some indication of the cost of introducing this uh, um, swirl chamber? Uh, it was in the range of half a million. And they got that money back within six months? Mm -hmm. Through not pre-grinding the pelletized fuels or... or yeah, through replacing the coal by um, RDF, that was still quite a lot. Yeah, so we are talking about 40% of the fuel was still uh, coal before, and they replaced it. So there is a, a big gap between the coal costs and the RDF. And this pre-grinding, of course, it costs you quite a lot to do that. Okay, and so after the modification, how much uh, coal were they obliged to use? Or could they... In the calciner? Yeah, zero. Zero. Okay, so they went, they did manage to go to zero cost. Absolutely yes. Okay, so that's a good uh, that's a good saving. Okay, uh, Samuel Zolsdorf asks, what was the temperature and gas velocity for the calibration of the lab furnace? How oh, the the velocity is a good question. Um, it was less than ten meters per second, so even a bit lower than in a calciner, and the temperature was. 950, as far as I remember. And sorry, the gas velocity was in the range of 10 meters per second, something like that. Okay. Okay. Um, how did the engineers come up with the idea for the swirl chamber? Uh, what does that mean? How, how Wait, did, they, you say that it hadn't been seen anywhere before? Yeah, they, they made a brainstorming, and I was quite surprised that they were coming up with such kind of an idea. Uh, because usually, uh, usually they are always afraid of doing something that is quite new. So, yeah, they developed it themselves. And do you expect to see that uh, adopted anywhere else? Well, to be honest, that is a very particular solution for that. So, uh, please don't conclude out of that, well, that is the solution for each and any plant. Um, that was a solution for this plant. The situation is always different, as I said before. Um, in that, that plant it worked, but the idea of a pre-combustion chamber is not too bad. Yeah. Uh, certainly if it's got a, an ROI of six months, I think a lot of cement plants will be quite interested in that possibility. Yes, but, uh, well, it's not a product, so you cannot buy it from the stock and then it's, uh, it's finished. So we have to develop, and this is our business, we develop uh, dedicated solutions for each and any plant. And I think it's not applicable to any plant. It's not applicable to every plant? To every plant, sorry. Okay, to but, every plant. but it, maybe it's applicable some, yes. to 5% of plants? Uh, yeah. I think you should give it a name and patent it. Oh, uh, no, you've told us all about it. You can't yeah, patent it late. anymore. It's sorry, late. it's too yeah. late. Just give it a name. Can I make an addition to that? Please. To that question. Uh, this very specific pre combustion mixing chamber has got its shape because of the uh, vertical injection of the uh, secondary fuels coming from below. Uh, because they didn't want to change that. 
for logistic reasons and a whole lot of reasons. That's why it's got this shape. If you have the regular horizontal speed of RDF into a combustion space, you would have picked a different geometry and it would have come up with a different solution. So that's why it's very unique to this plot because they're shooting up the RDF from below horizontal, uh, vertically into that combustion chamber. So you can please not uh, take this geometry, this solution, and apply it to a different plant where you don't have this injection. Okay, is there a, an argument to say that actually they should, could almost have easily changed the angle of injection of the, uh, of the fuels? They could, they didn't want to in this case because they have all the piping and everything. For some reason they didn't want to change that. So they changed the, 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 the requirement of what's coming after that. Okay. Um, are there any other questions from the floor in the real world? Yes, please, Leo. Uh, based on the information we just received about the injection of the mafia from the bottom, I would like to ask if there is any correlation between the velocity of the injecting RDS and efficiency of the system. It, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But that was not under investigation in that case, um, but there is. And uh, I suppose it has been uh, injected pneumatically with the speed around... Of 40, 40 meters per second. 40 meters per yeah, second. Yeah, so they, they also made many trials in increasing the speed. So they did not start with the 40 meters per second, they ended with the 40 meters okay. per second. Yeah, so they started with lower speeds and they did not succeed with the lower speeds. Okay, and uh, the last point is... Is there also any connection and impact of the quantity of the air? So if you add the more air uh, proportional... Yeah, of course, of course. That is a pneumatic problem. So with the, with the speed of the air, you also have an impact on the process. Thank you. Okay, Michael Grumman, please. Uh, the cost for our services are, let's say, in that case, in the range of 10% of the cost for the modification. Which is nothing uh, compared to the overall savings. Indeed. Thank you. There was another question. Please give us your name and company. Yeah, I'm from Amerika, Interservice Egypt. In fact, it's very interesting this discussion because we have the same new practice. So when, when we look from conventional sources to practice, normally for the entire design for such t sharp we speak about extension of the t sharp and then regulation of the of the of, of the timing by by having by having more 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 more, more detection in the industry. So this case study is typically is very interesting because you have to introduce a new dimension for the time. So do you think that this is a kind of disruption for the new design, the big kind of container that it was, it was further studying, because you are now, it makes a huge savings in terms of, uh, of civil engineering, because in the previous one, you need to spend most of, 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 uh, of evaluation for that application. In short, in short, do you think that, that, in, that this kind of, of design could be further evaluated and further because it could, it could be really a replacement for the, for the conventional design that we have now. Yeah, so we just have that, done that once. Um, you always need to be careful if you intensify the combustion too much that it overheats. So you need some cooling media there. Um, but the, I would say there is a chance to develop that further and to investigate whether it can be a, a nice modification or a nice, let's say, device for the further development. Yeah. I think you gentlemen should have a long discussion over some beers. Uh, we are already in. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or points from the floor? 
Okay, in which case, uh, let's thank our speaker, Matthias Schumacher, once again. Thank you very much.